today we're going to be talking about a topic that I am constantly trying to educate parents on because they're always experiencing it and most of the time not handling it in the correct way. And this is your child's use of noise. Welcome to the ADHD Guys podcast with Mike McLeod of Grow Now ADHD and Ryan Wexelblatt of ADHD Dude. Learn about parenting kids with ADHD from two male licensed professionals who specialize in ADHD and executive functions. No fluffy parenting advice, only practical information that will help you help your child. Why don't you explain to everybody when we talk about noise, what that means? So this is something that pretty much all kids are pretty good at, especially kids with ADHD and executive functioning challenges. So noise is their use of overall language, complaining, negative talk towards their, their choice to avoid a non-preferred topic or to avoid something they don't want to do. It's their overall use of negative language, negative complaining that draws parents in to respond to them because they feel like they're anxious or upset or have really negative feelings that parents have to respond to but it's really just kids' use of noise. I always explain it as arguing or complaining or negative talk just for the sake of arguing, complaining, or negative talk. That's my short exactly. up. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 all, and all kids do it. You know, this is something that parents have to understand. This is something that all kids do because that's what kids are supposed to do. Kids are supposed to test limits. They're supposed to complain. They're supposed to whine. You know, kids want to do kid things, but the appropriate thing to do based on research is to give them chores and homework and all these different things that they don't want to do and non-screen based tasks. So they will complain. They will be upset. Kids will complain about school, will complain about homework, will complain about their teachers. But if your child has ADHD, you can pretty much multiply that complaining times 15. And that's going to be the ADHD child. So Mike, one of the things I always explain to parents is, you know, kids with ADHD have a propensity to make noise, maybe more than kids without ADHD, because you know, when faced with having to do a non-preferred task, you know, they lack the resiliency often to get through these non-preferred tasks, or they're, you know, they don't have an understanding of how long the task will take because of their difficulty with sensing the passage of time. Nope. And for many of them, they learn that the more noise I make, the more undivided attention or emotional reactivity I get from my parents. Exactly. So a lot of what social media is teaching parents is that when kids are using noise, they're looking for connection. They're looking for a response. We have to be very careful about their anxiety levels or their trauma levels or their negative feelings about themselves or negative self-image. So when you hear noise, you have to respond to it or it could hurt your child. And Mike, can I share a comment I just got on one of my videos the other day? This parent said, you know, my, my son tends to, you know, get emotionally dysregulated easily. And whenever he does, you know, I validate his feelings and I reflect back to him how he's feeling and, and so on. And basically what she's saying is when he makes noise, I constantly respond to his noise with trying to make him feel better. And then she said, and then he, you know, escalates and then gets into hitting, you know, and what I had to explain to her is, right, when you respond to noise, right, with your undivided attention or, you know, in some cases, emotional reactivity, that's going to often exacerbate things. And then noise goes from noise to emotional dysregulation. And in this case, physical aggression. But the thing like I wanted to just mention about your point was that so many parents have been led to believe that anytime your kid expresses any kind of you know displeasure with anything or doesn't want to do anything, right, you have to jump in and validate their feelings and empathize, right, and, and so on. And, and really what that has taught parents is to reinforce, right, this negative language with attention constantly. Exactly. Noise might be the number one strategy technique that these kids use. So what I always try to teach parents is that kids simply do what works. Because when you're teaching parents first about noise, emotional manipulation, those things like that, you know, their first instinct is, oh, are you saying my, my son has no empathy? Are you saying he's a bad kid? They instantly rush to these because they're, th these phrases have negative connotations to it. You know, it's hard to hear these harsh words associated with your child. But it, it's very important to realize kids simply do what works. So if a kid learns that they could use noise and be negative and complain during homework time to avoid ha actually having to do the homework, or use noise 
to get more attention so they can get more screen time or use noise so they can be left alone when they want to be in their room with their phone, they're going to do it because it's working. Right. Like I want to touch on something you just said before. You know, in, in cognitive behavior therapy, we have this term called irrational thoughts. So irrational thoughts are thoughts that are, have no basis in evidence. So often parents will say, you know, when I explain to parents and when I teach in, you know, my scaffolding better behavior program is, you know, you do not give attention and emotional reactivity to negative behaviors, including noise. And parents often will sometimes object and say, well, I don't want him not to feel heard, you know, or she'll think I'm ignoring her, you know, or things like that. And, and really what those are, those are irrational thoughts. And I think what the problem is, is that those are normal for parents to have those thoughts, right? There, there are fears that somehow they're, they'll feel like they'll be neglecting or ignoring their child if they don't respond to noise. But I think what's complicated this, Mike, is as we both know, there's a lot of social media influencers out there and even some professionals who are telling parents, yes, take everything your, your child says completely seriously right? And, and respond to every single thing they say, over-validate them, you know, over-empathize with them, over-talk everything. And, and there's just no, ba there's no research to show that that's helpful. Exactly. I, I saw a really interesting quote, and this was about all kids in general, that I think 85% of kids quit their sport on the ride home from practice, which is probably oh, wow. when they're, yeah, so, and that's just all kids. So they're probably in the car with their parent and they're complaining of everyone's better than me. I'm not having fun, those sorts of things. And the parents are feeding into the negativity. They're responding to it. Uh, and a lot of these boys with ADHD, mostly boys, you know, they, they do a pretty good job at figuring out how to pull out those heartstrings and get some negative attention seeking, some sympathy seeking to be able to pull themselves out of things that are out of their comfort zone. So when parents are signing them up for sports, activities, clubs, whatever it may be to ensure the child is having varied experiences, which is one of the most important things for parents of kids with ADHD to do is get your kid in varied experiences. You have to be able to persevere through the noise because it's, it's pretty inevitable at some point they're, gonna, they're going to complain about it. Mike, one of the things, I don't know if I ever told you this, but in my school year programs and in my camp, one of the things I send out to parents initially is, I say, for some of you, expect that your son is going to have a negative reaction, right, to the program. And here's what he's going to say. He's going to come home and complain and say, those kids are weird. They're not like me. It was boring. I say, and you have to understand that for kids with ADHD, who, as you and I both know, don't like coming out of their comfort zone, when they are pushed to come out of their comfort zone and in a new experience, they're going to make noise. And often that noise is going to be about, this is boring. Those kids aren't like me and so on. And that's not a problem. The problem is, as I mentioned, when parents take everything they say so literally, you know, and that's why I say to parents, you know, if they make noise and complain, I said, don't worry about it. It will go away. OK. And what's most important is you don't let them escape something that's uncomfortable, because if you do, then you're sending them the message. Right. Anytime there's temporary discomfort, I will rescue you and let you avoid it. And what we know is you don't develop resiliency and you don't learn how to persevere through temporary discomfort by avoiding things. In fact, that makes things worse. Exactly. And and the, the, the biggest thing that I can compare this to is when a parent signs their child up for our, our grown out coaching services, then after the first session, they'll complain and say, you know, this is, this is stupid. I don't want to do this. Why am I doing this sort of thing? And the parents will cancel and pull them out. And it's an unbelievably high percentage that a couple of weeks later, a couple of months later, they end up reaching back out and saying, we're in the same hole. We, you know, we still need help. It was just the parent validating that child's feelings and falling for their noise. You know, the, the child realized, oh, here's this added person that's now going to increase accountability on me, be on my parents' side, and being on a in a one-hour session with this person is keeping me away from my screens. And this also reminds me of pretty much all the time when I'm on the call with for intake calls with parents, one of their number one concerns is, how am I going to tell my child about this? What, what language should I use to tell my child that I'm signing them up for these services? And it could, because deep down, they're scared of their child's reactions and they know their kid's going to complain. So they want to know what to say because they're so scared their kid's going to be upset. Like, you know, the other thing I was just saying, it was a few years ago, just I wanted to go back to my camp thing for a minute. You know, one of, one of the parents reached out to me after like the second day of camp and they said, 
you know, our son did exactly what you said he was going to do. He came home after the first day and said, you know, I'm not like these kids. I don't like them. They're nerds, whatever. And then by the second day, when he, you know, made connections with kids, which typically is what happens with camp. It takes two days. Then he was completely fine. And I said to them, you know, I really appreciate you saying this. And I appreciate you not responding to his noise because I can't tell you to your point how often this happens that as soon as kids make a little noise, right, or express that they don't want to do something, you know, then the parent goes into this, you know, rescue mode of thinking, I have to rescue him, right? As as if temporary discomfort is somehow going to be traumatizing. And I think like, that's one of the things that really concerns me the most right now is how many parents have been led to believe that number one, temporary discomfort equals trauma. And number two, their child is going to be damaged by, you know, having coaching or, you know, coming to one of my programs or, you know, your camp or whatever it is, you know, um, it's just, it's really unfortunate that we've gotten to this point because, you know, as usual, we can blame social media for everything, but you know, that parents are really, they've been misled, you know, by, and by in, right. By information that contradicts all the research data on this. So this worry that noise is going to not responding to noise is going to lead to trauma. We're seeing now in parenting circles, this really being taken to the extreme, you know, in how many cases has noise about school and all of the non-preferred tasks associated with school led to increased school refusal. You know, that's one of the things that really concern me about today's generation and today's generation of parents and the minds that they have. Think of all the kids now that aren't even going to school. They're sitting home all day in front of screens watching Minecraft videos because parents responded to their complaining about school. It's frightening. It really is. Frightening. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mike, you know, even if we take this down a notch and say, you know, the amount of parents that say, you know, like, well, I don't want them not to feel heard, you know, because your child disagrees with you or because your child doesn't want to do something you're requiring them to do. That doesn't mean that they don't feel heard because I am sure you're listening to them. But I think, Mike, we also have to talk about and This is something that I teach that noise can easily or I should say it this way. Noise easily leads to emotional manipulation. So why don't you talk a little bit about, number one, what that means, and two, what it looks like. Absolutely. So as a child is successful with their noise, because once again, kids do what works. So once their negative talk, their complaining, their you know outward use of negative language reaches a level of pretty unprecedented success, they're having lots of success with it now, it's now going to lead to more significant strategies this child is going to utilize to maintain a sense of control over their parents and their life. And then it pretty much goes from noise to emotional manipulation, where the child is now using specific language to purposefully make their parents feel a certain type of way about them. Of, oh, my child is sad. My child is anxious. My child, my child has social anxiety, those sorts of things, or lots of anxiety towards school or sports or whatever. So I need to, you know, give him more of what makes him happy, which is the screens and the the downtime and things like that. Or he's masking all day at school. Let's, you know, let's allow him to come home and be on screens. You know, that that the success with noise leads to higher levels of emotional manipulation, which many, many parents fall for. Mike, let's let's give some examples of common things we hear kids say when noise isn't working for them than to emotionally manipulate their parents. But I think like before that, we have to address something. You know, we've both had comments on social media where people say kids can't manipulate, <laughs> you know, and all the time, go ahead. all the yeah. time. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, a, a really popular thing I always see on social media is there, there are no bad kids, just bad feelings or, so, or some, something to that sense. I've seen so many pages just reframe that, repost that, put it in beautiful writing, put it to music and post it, and it gets a thousand shares. We're not saying your kids are bad. You know, kids like, I, I believe you had a great quote one time that was like, kids with ADHD don't wake up and say, oh, I'm going to piss off my parents today. You know, right? Yeah. So like, yeah, it, yeah. That's, exact, that's exactly it. Like, they're not doing it. Like, they're not sitting there and plotting out malicious ways to attack people. They're just doing what works. You know, these are kids where their entire lives are their parents, school, and, you know, they they have small little things to do. They don't have all these different responsibilities that adults do. They're just learning to control situations because they're still learning about life. They're still children. They still have underdeveloped brains. 
So we're, no one is attacking your child. No one's attacking their character. ADHD is not a character flaw. We don't have to keep saying this and repeating it just for public relation purposes. You know, this it, it's it's it's, pre, it's pretty obvious that we're at this point. We're not attacking people, but this is what kids do, and neurotypical kids do this also. But ADHD kid ADHD kids will do it to the extreme. Absolutely. And Mike, I think the other thing for people to understand is when we talk about emotional manipulation, there's nothing vindictive in that. As Mike was saying, it's a way for them to try to avoid temporary discomfort or fear of the unknown or their lack of resiliency to get through something that is difficult or not interesting to them. That's all. There is no bad intention behind it. I, I think Mike- Exactly. Was like, exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and you being the parent and you pushing your child into those experiences, you know, social media is very big on reframing things. How about we reframe this a little bit? Your child's complaining, your child's noise that you're pushing them out of their comfort zone is probably a sign that you're doing something right. You know, like, mm -hmm. so if they're complaining about that you sign them up for a sport or an activity or sign them up at the YMCA or something that gets them out of the house and moving and exercising away from screens, that complaining, let's reframe that from, oh, they're anxious, they're traumatized, they're this, they're that. Let's change that now to, hey, I'm doing my role as a parent. I'm following research-based authoritative parenting, and I'm giving them varied experiences that are going to pre prepare them for real life. Mike, before we get into how parents should deal with noise and give them some actionable strategies, let's give some specific examples because we know of how our audience loves examples of what you know this emotional manipulation often sounds like. So some of the things I typically hear is, you know, you don't care about me. You don't love me. You know, if you if you cared about me, you wouldn't make me do this, right? Or you're not listening to me. That's a big one that really works well on mothers. You're not listening to me. Yeah, and another really big one is comparing you to other parents. So you're the meanest oh, yeah. parent. You're the meanest parent out of all my friends. None of my friends, none of my friends have screen time limits. None of my friends have have uh, their phones taken away or parental controls on their phone. You're the meanest parent in the whole world. I, I, I can't believe you're doing this. Uh, you doing this to me is making me lose friends. You doing this to me is ma is getting me bullied. All, all those sorts of things about comparing you to other people and blaming you for specific experiences in life. Right. And we can go on. You hate me or, you know, you love my brother more than me. There's there's many. Yeah. Nonsense. All nonsense. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about how should parents deal with noise. So number one is you don't give attention and emotional reactivity to noise. And let me clarify, because people get really confused about this. That doesn't mean you need to ignore your child. Rather, it means you don't respond to the noise. So for instance, if your child says, I'm not going, don't give that a response. Or, you know, that's stupid. I'm not doing that. Don't give it a response. Whatever the noise is, it doesn't require a response. Even if your child goes from noise to emotional manipulation and says, well, if you cared about me, you would respond to me. Okay. Which is what my son used to do, by the way, right? <laughs> Doesn't need a response. Exactly. And another great example of noise is I was talking to a parent on the phone the other day. And of course, this mom falls into the same trap many parents do of you find yourself basically being their homework secretary every day after school, sitting with them and micromanaging, micromanaging their homework. So this mom was telling me a story of sitting with her son, trying to help him with homework. And the homework was hard and challenging. So the, stu so the son started using noise and he was saying, I don't need school. I don't need homework. I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to make a ton of money. And I'm going to I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to make a lot of money and I'm not going to need school. I'm not going to need teachers. I'm not going to need homework. And the mom, instead of just not responding, said, oh, yeah, what are you going to do? How are you going to make money? How are you going to start up? Where are you going to go? What's your invention going to be? How are you going to get a patent? How are you going to get a copyright? Just throwing so much information at this child, so much language and attention to their noise. It eventually got to the point where the child like couldn't think of what else to say and just got up and ran out of the house and, 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 and started having escape behavior. So it made it worse. So, so sometimes responding to noise, you know, not only internally makes it worse because you're teaching the child this noise works. Sometimes externally, it can make them even more dysregulated. A lot of the times it makes them more dysregulated. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, I think like, I mean, that speaks to, we should do a whole episode about this, about how parents often unintentionally, right, cause emotional dysregulation because they won't stop talking. Yeah, know, exactly. Which is very, which is very tied to this topic. Yeah. But maybe that's another episode. So, 
Okay, so aside from not giving attention to the noise or not giving it emotional reactivity, and that includes, you know, validation and over empathy, like why don't you give an example of how a parent can respond to noise in a very simple way that's not over validating or over empathizing? Yep. Like so give a, course, yeah, we'll, give we'll, a specific example. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So 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 let's say the child is complaining about homework or complaining about, you know, a sport coming up or an activity and they're using lots of negative language and thing and things like that. And you can just very quickly say to them, I can see you're upset. I can see you're anxious about this, whatever. One quick simple sentence acknowledging and validating their feelings. I see your blank and fill it in with a feeling. This is an expectation and not a choice. Please come to me when you are ready and prepared to go. And you walk away. Or I would say, you know, I'd come, you know, why don't you take some, or, you know, if they're really getting dysregulated, I would say, take some time for your brain to calm down and then come to me when, you, when you're ready. You know, Mike, one of the things to, to your point there, which I liked is, you know, it kind of feeds into my saying, you know, 80% less words that when you want to validate how your child's feeling or acknowledge what they're saying, say it with 80% less words than you mean to. Absolutely. Less language is always better. And another great thing that, that, that I've, I've heard from you is using the word stuck. So you can say, I can see your brain is stuck right now. I can see your brain coach is stuck right now. You know, why don't you take some time to, you know, take some time to relax and get unstuck and then come to me when you're ready. So when your child is calm and regulated and you teaching them about what ready versus not ready is like can really help you in these dysregulation moments. So you can let the child know, I can only engage with you when you're ready, when you're calm. When you are dysregulated, you're upset, you have very big emotions, I can't, it's it, it's not helpful for me to talk to you and pr provide language to you. I can acknowledge your feelings and tell you how you're feeling, but that's not a time for me to give you advice and have a deep conversation with you. You have to come to me when you're ready and ready to have a back and forth conversation. And let's clarify, Mike, that that is not a discussion to happen when your child's already escalated or frustrated. Correct. That's a conversation to have outside of these moments because- if you have that conversation when they're already escalated or frustrated, that will escalate them even more. So these kind of conversations that Mike just described happen outside of that, that time frame. Oh, also, Mr. Mike, by the way, it's brain voice in 2024, not brain coach. Brain voice. Yes. Yeah. Well, because you know why, actually, because I switch it to brain voice because I, you know, if we want to help make them more aware of their internal dialogue, I think brain voice is a little more accurate than brain coach. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's gonna take some time. That's gonna take some time to get used to. I've been saying brain coach for a long time. But yeah, they're both they're, they're they're both great. Yeah, brain coach is a, is a is a really cool term for verbal working memory, which is the self directed talk, which these kids are lacking. So they're lacking an internal system of checks and balances to give them the resiliency to persevere through non preferred tasks, and that's exactly what's happening here. So things that seem difficult they are going to complain about. And it is your role as the parent to not let that complaining win. To have a child that has the grit, that has the resiliency, that can persevere through non-preferred tasks that are not going to traumatize them, not going to increase their anxiety. They're going to give them skills and make them feel better about themselves than any video game ever could, any screen ever could, any validation from parents of you're so great, you're so smart ever could them actually doing things themselves, persevering and completing, that that's what increases self-worth. Mike, I think there's one more thing we need to clarify about this because as we know, there's many kids who see a talk therapist, despite the fact that ADHD is, you know, talk therapy is not a recommended treatment for kids with ADHD. But one of the things I want to explain to parents is this. If your child goes to a therapist, Letting them go to the therapist and just having them vent the whole time about what they're annoyed about with this kind of stuff is not helpful. And let me explain why. Because the more discussion there is around it and the more an adult is validating them and letting them go on and on about this, the more they're going to ruminate about it, meaning the longer their brain is going to get stuck on it. Okay. So if your child goes to a therapist, well, number one, please know that what the evidence shows about, you know, talk therapy for kids with ADHD, it's not helpful. But number two, you know, because I know people will go regardless because they're this is really stuck in their head. Please explain to the therapist, do not let him or her go on and on about not wanting to go to, you know, tutoring or whatever. Please cut the conversation off because that is really hard for therapists to do because often with the best of intentions, therapists come from a place of over empathy for kids and want the kid to feel heard and they want to align with the kid. 
But what they're not realizing is they're actually making this worse because they're giving it so much energy and validation. Exactly. And this is what a lot of talk therapy is doing. It's teaching kids to really ruminate on these negative thoughts and giving them a lot more validation than ever needed. When a lot of a lot of the times the kids are kind of past it, you know, like that, th you know, they may have their talk therapy session on Wednesday and this negative experience happened on Sunday. And now they're being asked to bring it back up and talk about it. And, you know, they you know, I was past that. I was past it. You know, you're just asking me to talk about a negative experience too much. So, you know, talk therapy, we, ha we have to be very careful about that, the way that it's really focusing on these negative experiences. And many of these talk therapists will over-validate the child, over-validate the negative process and negative, yeah, and to a point where it's teaching the child, uh, you know, a little too much about, you know, these negative feelings and ways to escape them. Mike, I want to tell you a story real quick. I had a kid who used to come to my school year programs who had a propensity he had some anxiety and he had a propensity, you know, particularly with his mother to be overly negative. And she was extremely reactive to any discomfort he had, right? Anytime he would express anxiety, anytime he would express that he didn't want to do something, super reactive. So one of the things was he went to a therapist at an ADHD clinic at a major children's hospital you might be familiar with. Why this major children's hospital has therapy for kids with ADHD is beyond me, okay? But my point is, he would go to this therapist and I said, and I said to the mother, I said, I explained to her, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics treatment recommendations. And I said, what is the therapist working on with him exactly? I thought maybe they're doing executive functioning, maybe something useful. And she said, well, it's really just a place for him to vet. And I said, how is it helpful to drive an hour into this major city, right? So he can spend an hour venting to a therapist, right? About things he's annoyed he has to do. I said, we know he has a propensity to get stuck on things, right? We know he has a propensity to focus on the negatives. And we know that, you know, you tend to be highly reactive to this. So by giving it even more validation and letting him go somewhere and spend an hour just venting to somebody, how is that helpful in any way to him? And, and she said, I, I don't know. Exactly. And I, I've been reading a lot about, you know, how kids will always learn more from watching us than they do from, from listening to our lectures. So we are, as adults, are always modeling to kids. And, and what we're basically talking about here is we're talking about a group of adults who have become 100% reactive and 0% proactive. So when kids learn to just react to every negative feeling, react and escape, and you know all of this negativity is not just, you know, not just persevering through a hard task, it's now anxiety and trauma and, you know, demand avoidance, whatever it may be. All of these, you know, all of these things that are just blowing it up and over pathologizing it to, we're reacting it instead of being proactive. And that's, that should be every parent's goal for their child is to give them a set of skills to be proactive enough to persevere through anything. You know, kids are anti-fragile, right? You know, kids can, can persevere through way more than we ever give them credit for. And we have to teach kids to be proactive and, hey, I'm having a negative feeling. I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm feeling anxious. All of these things. Okay, what's in my toolkit to persevere through this task instead of going with my initial instinct to escape or complain? Mike, I just have to say, because you brought this up, you know, the thing that I think bothers me the most right now in, in my field, the mental health field, and I think to an extent in the speech language pathology field, but maybe not to the, as, as much is the amount I'm hearing about therapists teaching kids fragility rather than helping them to develop yeah. resiliency. It's really disturbing. It's incredibly disturbing. And this is this is a major trend. And even uh, Jonathan Haidt talks about it in, in his new book about kids, you know, talking about how kids are anti-fragile. And the more that we look at these kids as fragile and the smallest little experience outside of their comfort zone is going to send them to therapy for years is going to send them to anti-anxiety medication, is going to send them to homeschool and, you know, school refusal, whatever it may be, or I can't, <clears throat> I can't sign them up for activities. They're going to get anxious from it. That's keeping them from life experiences that will benefit them. And just so everyone knows, if you, if you didn't get this yet, that the way kids learn to overcome anxiety is through realizing anxiety is a temporary feeling, just like all feelings are temporary, and that Anxiety goes up and then it goes down. 
when you are allowed to avoid anxiety, that makes anxiety worse because you never realize you possess the ability to get through it. Exactly. And and one of the best ways to decrease anxiety is to improve executive functioning, period. Because executive functioning is your self-regulation of emotions. So you want to decrease anxiety. You want to increase executive functions. The best way to increase executive functions is through varied experiences. It is the kids that wake up, go to school, come home, stay home, or don't even go to school at all that are the most anxious. We Kids, kids learn to lose anxiety when they are thrust into new experiences, learn to persevere without constant adults helicoptering and adult assistance. You know, they're signed up for a sport and they and they go and do it and they they initiate, persist and complete. That's what builds self-worth, gaining real skills and doing things on your own. Mike, for a final thought, the one thing that I want to mention is this and then I want to hear yours is I one of the things I've also seen is when kids make a lot of noise, sometimes very anxious parents will stay where the kid is. So for instance, let's say they're, you know, joining a new soccer team and they like soccer, but they're anxious about it and they're making noise and saying, I don't want to go. Those kids are not going to be as good as me. Well, sometimes what I'll see an anxious parent do is stay there. And then by even just staying there and observing the kid, then the kid starts feeding in, right? Feeding into that and manipulating them, right? Manipulating the parent because they know there's a point where my parent is going to turn and say, okay, you don't have to do this again. So one of the things I tell people is, if you if your child has a propensity to make noise when they're at a new activity, you staying there is is the least helpful thing that you could do because it's just going to exacerbate things. That's a great example because I can I can just picture it in my head now. You know, a teen or a child with ADHD, you know, being signed up for soccer and having lots of noise about it, and then going on the field and then seeing their parent right there on the corner of their eye, they're going to start having really negative body language and not trying so hard and starting to do things to show their parent, I don't want to do this because at the end of the day, they don't want to be at soccer practice. They want to be at home watching Minecraft videos. So it's it's so incredibly important for parents to be aware of that. And you're right. You know, you need to back off. You need to get away, you know, drop them off, pick them up. And when they get back, have conversation. And when they get back in the car, don't jump right into how was practice? What happened? How did you do? All of these things that instantly pull, you know, give that you're basically giving them a microphone to express more noise. And when they get in the car after school, don't jump directly into how was school today? Who did you sit with? Who did you talk to? How did school make you feel? Give them space to sit and relax where they they're not just instantly assuming you're going to run through a giant list of questions about how everything went. Mike, you know, I have a term for that. I call it fishy for the negatives. That that's exactly it. Yeah, I I describe it as you're basically giving them the stage, you're giving them the microphone where they're just running the show. You're basically asking for them to emotionally manipulate you, or yeah, yeah, or, and make yeah. noise. You're you're just giving them the microphone and saying, here, here's my emotional, you know, well being. It's now in your control. So closing thoughts, stop responding to noise. You're not going to traumatize your child. You're not going to hurt them. They're not going to be in a therapist's office 30 years from now saying, my mother was so horrible. You know, she she didn't respond when I told her that all those kids were nerds, right? They're going to be perfectly fine. Sure. As Mike said, kids are not fragile. They are anti-fragile. Exactly. And I think just to reiterate, if your child is complaining about the things you signed them up for, if your child is complaining about homework, about school, or, you know, the different things that, you know, you make an expectation like chores or things like that, as a parent, chances are you're doing something right, period. You are pushing your child out of their comfort zone, holding them to a high standard, high expectations, and expecting them to reach it. That's exactly what parents are supposed to do. So the complaining is showing that you're not being permissive you're actually pushing them to hold themselves to a high standard. That is an excellent point to end on. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Mike's practice, Grow Now ADHD, please visit his website at grownowadhd.com. To learn about the services Ryan provides, please visit adhddude.com. You can find Mike on Instagram at grownowadhd. And you can find Ryan at the ADHD Dude YouTube channel. The ADHD Guys podcast and content posted by either Grow Now ADHD or ADHD Dude is presented solely for general informational and educational purposes. The use of information on this podcast 
is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, licensed mental health professional, or other qualified professional, diagnosis, or treatment. Listeners should not disregard or delay in obtaining professional advice for any medical or mental health condition they or their child may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.